Hello and welcome to the Canon EOS tutorial, the power to explore portrait and landscape photography. With a little help from some professional photographers who are experts in their field, we're going to teach you the fundamentals of photography and also show you the must-have skills that you'll need to take great portrait and landscape shots. And once you've got that picture, we'll show you how to process and retouch it with Canon's own image processing software, Digital Photo Professional, to make your photos look as good as they possibly can. Landscape expert David Clapp will be out in the Lake District, showing you how to get the most from your landscape photographs and teaching you a few tricks to take your shots to the next level. In the Lake District, we're surrounded by stunning scenery and I'll be helping you learn how to manage everything when you're out on location, from lens choice and framing, all the way through to perspective and depth of field. Also working through landscape photography is Martin Osner on location in South Africa. He'll be explaining the essential skills to produce stunning landscapes, from sunsets to seascapes. We're here in this hugely varied environment and I'm gonna show you how to get the most out of your landscape photography. I'll also be working in the studio revealing some incredible tips and tricks on how to get professional looking portraits that stand out from the rest. And our expert portrait photographer, Heather Buckley, is teaching us how to get great candid and event portraits. Candid portraiture allows you to get some great natural results. It'll really help you tell the story just as well as any stage shop would. I'm gonna show you some techniques that'll help you get the best out of any event. After all that, I'll be showing you the next stage for all your images with post-shot processing in DPP, Canon's image editing software that's included with your camera. In the final chapter, we'll be sitting down with our experts to get some real insight into their own work. Plus, they'll be giving some great tips for you to try yourself. There's a huge amount to show you, and by the end, you'll know how to get the best out of your Canon camera and kit. But first up, the basics. In this first chapter, Photography Basics, our experts and myself will be giving you useful tips to help you understand your Canon camera and its features. We're going to be taking a look at equipment, RAWs and JPEGs, and the shooting modes on the camera itself. And then our experts will help you understand the basic principles of white balance, shutter speed, ISO, depth of field, aperture, and exposure. We're going to be using two EOS models, the 6D and the 650D. They're both designed on the same principles, but with a few key differences. The first thing you'll notice is that the control setup is different from one camera to the next. So the 6D is designed to offer you the very best full manual control, so it's got lots of buttons dedicated to specific adjustments. The 650D also has full manual control, but it's a little less overwhelming in its design, with features like the touch screen and the cross keys instead of the dial for making changes. On both cameras, the shooting mode dial is located here on the top. That's for choosing all of the different shooting modes. On the 6D and the 650D, the main dial is located here. That makes the principal changes to your camera settings like shutter speed and ISO. On the 6D, you also have the multi-control dial, which in manual mode controls the aperture, while the main dial controls the shutter speed. On the 650D, to adjust the aperture in manual mode, you press this button and use the main dial. On the back of both cameras, the cross keys or the multi-control dial can also be used to navigate through the camera's menus. Aside from the aperture and the shutter speed, you can also set most of the camera settings by using the quick control screen, which you reach by pressing the Q button. Apart from the configuration, the main difference between these two cameras is the size of the sensor. The sensor is the camera's digital negative. It's what actually captures your photograph. The 6D has a full frame sensor. That means that the sensor is the same size as a piece of 35 millimeter film. The 650D has a cropped APS-C sensor. So it crops the field of view by a factor of 1.6. But what does this mean in practical terms? Well, this is the kind of shot that you'll get if you use a 20 mm lens on a full frame sensor. But then take that same lens and put it onto a new body with a cropped sensor, and it's the equivalent of using a 32 mm lens. So the effect of a cropped sensor is to multiply your focal length by a factor of 1.6. 
A full frame sensor captures more information, so it produces the best possible picture quality. But both sensors have their advantages, and the one that you choose will directly influence the lens that you use. For example, if you're into telephoto work, you like wildlife and sports, then a crop sensor is probably the way to go. However, if you want a really wide shot for landscapes, then a full frame sensor is probably the better option. The shooting mode dial on your camera will give you access to its preset intelligent shooting modes. These are divided into two types, basic modes and creative modes. In the basic modes, the camera will automatically select the parameters that will give you the best possible shot. The main basic mode is scene intelligent auto mode. That means the camera essentially does all the work for you. You just need to choose your frame and press the shutter. But it's the creative modes that we're going to focus on because these are the ones that are going to enable you to really get the best out of your camera. In P, program mode, the camera will select both the shutter speed and the aperture, but you do still have some creative influence. In TV, which stands for time value, it's shutter priority. In this one, you choose the shutter speed and the camera will then select automatically the aperture to ensure the correct exposure. This is great for photographs that might involve some sort of movement. In AV, aperture priority mode, you select the aperture and the camera will then automatically choose the shutter speed again to obtain the correct exposure. This is the one I generally use for portraits because it enables you to control the depth of field. More about that later, but basically you can create that nice blurred background. Moving into M, that sounds for manual, that puts you in complete control. You choose both the aperture and the shutter speed. So you're in charge of the exposure, but the camera will still help you out. It's still going to be metering for you and also will show you on the exposure dial whether you're over or underexposed. And finally, B. B stands for bulb. This puts you in complete control of the shutter speed. As long as you hold down the shutter button, the shutter will stay open. On the 6D, this has got its own mode setting, but on the 650, you'll find the bulb setting at the far end of the shutter speed range in manual mode. This is great for shots that require a really long exposure. In the menu section, the Image Quality tab enables you to choose between shooting RAW files or shooting JPEGs. The best way to remember the difference between these two is that essentially a RAW file is like a film negative, whereas a JPEG is like a print. A JPEG is a compressed file format, so it's much smaller. That makes it much easier to share, but you do risk losing a bit of picture quality. A RAW file is Canon's own uncompressed file format. This is the one that most professional photographers use. It's got much more information in it, it's much larger, and that makes it great for using and working with in Canon's DPP software, in which you can change some of the camera's settings. So, now that we know where all the settings are on the camera and the modes, let's go to our experts in the field to find out more about the principles of those controls. White balance is important in managing the colour in your photography. Human vision is quite forgiving when it comes to colour costs. So if we were to take a white card and to look at it on a bright sunny day and then to go and look at it in different colours of light, like a tungsten artificial light or perhaps in shade, that white card would appear quite white to us. However, the camera is going to record that with a colour cost. If we were to photograph in shade, the resulting colour of shade is blue. If you want to remove the blue, you would set your white balance setting to the shade setting and the reference will be back to what you and I would probably see. On the other hand, if you want to record the colour of light, leave your white balance setting on daylight setting. Now the resulting colours of these different light sources are going to actually record. This is quite nice in your photography because it tends to add colour to the picture. The third way you can look at using your, your white balance is by using the custom settings. In daylight, shade and cloudy weather is going to record orange, fluorescence is going to record green, tungsten will record with blue costs. Keep in mind that if you were to shoot in JPEG, the colour is going to be processed into the file. If you're shooting in RAW, you have the ability of changing this afterwards. If you're unsure of the colour of light that you're in and you're wanting to neutralise that light, the camera does offer you a fantastic option where you can take a white card and you can place it in front of the lens and the camera will measure the colour of light and neutralise it for you. Your camera also has an auto white balance setting. This is really useful if you're photographing in different light sources at the same time. Here the camera will work out the best colour setting and neutralise those colour costs for you. To gain 
full control of your camera, you're going to have to understand the basic principles of exposure, which is going to be your ISO, your shutter speed, and your aperture. Now, the exposure is the amount of light that falls onto your sensor. Too much light and you will overexpose the image, and too little light, you will underexpose the image. An exposure is the single opening and closing of the shutter. It's vital to understand these basic principles of exposure in order to become a better photographer. Aperture is a setting on the camera that allows light to enter into the camera itself. Basically, there are blades inside that drop down and open back up again, and this is measured in f-stops. So f1.4 is a very large hole, whereas f22 is a very small hole. The lens I've got here is a 24mm lens, f2.8, all the way down to f22. Your choice of aperture will ultimately affect your depth of field. Depth of field is the term given to what's in focus in your image. It's the distance between the nearest and furthest points where everything is in focus. Depth of field is affected by the aperture setting. A large number gives you a larger depth of field, whereas a small number gives you a smaller or shallower depth of field. Looking through the viewfinder allows you to see the depth of field at maximum aperture. This allows you to compose your pictures with the brightest view that you possibly can. To preview the depth of field, press the depth of field preview button on the side of the camera. This stops the lens down to show you the full depth of field. For example, in this setup, we have a mountain view with some close foreground rocks. At f2.8, only the mountains are in focus, but after I increase my aperture to f16, I can get both the mountain scene and the rocks in focus. The image now has greater depth of field. This principle and combined technique can be used to dramatic creative effect in all of your images. Shutter speed is measured in fractions of seconds, seconds, minutes, or even hours. Think of a shutter as a door in the camera that opens and closes to let in light. You can change the shutter speed according to what you want to do. You can actually control the amount of movement in a picture. For example, if you want to freeze movement, you would use a faster shutter speed. Something like 2,000th of a second, maybe 4,000th of a second, would be able to freeze most subjects. Or you can even drop your shutter speed down to a really slow shutter speed and blur. Something like a quarter of a second, maybe half a second, or even a full second is going to allow you to blur elements in your picture. Just keep in mind that if you're going to drop your shutter speed, maybe to a second or beyond, you are going to need a tripod to keep the camera steady. Shutter speeds also assist you when you want to handhold your camera and avoid camera shake. As a rule of thumb, whatever focal length you decide to shoot on, get one shutter speed quicker than that. So for example, if you were shooting on a 50 millimeter lens, a 60th of a second would be fantastic. If you're shooting on a 100 millimeter lens, 125th of a second would be great. But of course, if your lens has an image stabilizer, you're going to be able to still get sharp pictures even below this critical point. It's fantastic to have. The last important fundamental of photography is your ISO. Now your ISO refers to the sensitivity of the sensor in your camera. It used to refer to film and you used to have to have a fast film which gave you a, a high ISO. Your general standard ISO is going to be around 100 to 12,800. The 6D, however, can go up to an incredible 25,600 and even more if you have ISO expansion enabled. So the higher the ISO number that you use, the more light your sensor is going to absorb. And the lower the number, the less light it's going to absorb. Lower numbers are better for sharpness, because one of the problems with high ISOs is the amount of noise that you get. Now you can use that to great effect with black and white photography, because then it can be part of the mood. You can have a nice, gritty, strong, punchy, high contrast image using high ISO in low light conditions in black and white. So far, we've broadly covered the principles of photography and shown you how to set up your Canon camera for certain situations. But mastering these elements is what's going to make you a better photographer. All photographers have their own style, and that's something you'll develop. But first, you have to understand the basics to help you take control of your camera to produce professional, creative images.
In this section, we're looking at landscape photography. First off, I'm going to run through everything you need to think about before you start shooting. And from there, we're off to the Lake District to join expert landscape photographer, David Clapp. He's gonna be taking a look at framing, perspective, focus, and depth of field. From there, it's off to South Africa to take a look at light and exposure and photographing water with our second professional photographer, Martin Osner. And finally, we'll meet some of our enthusiasts who've been testing out everything we've featured. They'll show us their results and we'll find out what worked best for them. Landscape photography is a hugely varied style of shooting and there are a lot of principles to get your head around. Before you even arrive on location, it's sensible to thoroughly research the area you're visiting. This will help you to find the best areas for shooting and give you a good idea about the weather conditions you'll face. To get the shot, you will need to take your time, so make sure that you've got enough clothing to cover all possible weather conditions. Once you're out and ready to shoot, you'll have to work out where you want to take your shots in relation to the subject and position of the sun. When shooting landscapes, it's important you have the right lens for the job. A good wide-angle lens is probably the most important piece of equipment for your kit. Any lens wider than 35mm would technically be classed as wide-angle. One last essential piece of kit is the tripod. There's a wide variety available, so look around for the one that suits you best. A selection of filters will allow you to really take control of the environment you're photographing, and we'll look at these in more detail throughout the chapter. You may want to consider using a remote release. This will enable you to work hands-free, which is vital for long exposure shots. Landscape photography is about working with your environment and learning how to harness the elements to capture images. If you're using a camera like the 6D, which has GPS built in, then make sure you've enabled it on all your landscape trips. This means that when you review your photos, you can see the exact location that all your best results were taken. If your camera doesn't have GPS built in, you can use the GPE2 accessory. Once you understand the fundamentals and the essential kit needed, you can shoot landscapes that will be worthy of any coffee table book. But first of all, let's have a look at how different lenses and different focal lengths will influence your images. Using a wide-angled lens allows you to fit more of the scene into your frame and it will give your photographs more depth and distance. If you choose this, for example, EFS 10 to 22, you'll find it really spreads the angle of view but increase the focal length and you'll start changing the perspective of the shot. Let's look at this shot of a vase, for example. If we keep the vase in the same position and the same frame size, but we move backwards as we increase the focal length, you can see clearly what happens to the background. It completely changes the perspective. Most landscape photography requires a large depth of field, so as much of the photo is in focus as possible. This means that you don't need a lens with a particularly wide aperture, so that doesn't have to be one of the governing factors in your kit selection. I like to have a small amount of zoom in my landscape lenses because you can't always take the shot from exactly the spot you want. So if you've got a little focal length that you can play with, then you can frame things out that you don't want to include. That said, landscape photography isn't all about super wide shots. Sometimes it's useful to have a longer zoom as well. You might want to hone in on particular details. And this 70 to 300 L series is really useful for that. So actually, it's advisable to have two lenses in your landscape kit, a wider zoom and a longer zoom, and those will give you between them a huge number of framing options for your landscape photography. Using a long zoom like this helps you pick out unusual details, but it also compresses the distance between the background and the foreground. A great zoom lens for a cropped sensor camera is this, the EFS 10 to 22 mil. It's the equivalent of a 16 to 35 millimeter on a full frame camera. And if you are using something like the 6D, something like this, the 17 to 40 mil lens is another great option. As with all photography, it's about preparation and consideration. So don't be afraid to change lenses or completely reposition if you're not happy with your frame. As I mentioned earlier, filters are another important part of your camera kit. There are lots of different types available, but we're just gonna concentrate on two. Firstly, neutral density, or ND filters. These are used essentially for cutting out light. There's a range of different strengths available, but they all serve the same purpose. If you're shooting a long exposure shot, this will allow you to set a slow shutter speed without overexposing your photograph. 
And then polarizing filters. This has a very different job. You use these to cut down the reflection or the glare that appears in your shots. They'll increase the saturation of an image and make your colors look much warmer and richer. These filters are both really useful when you're photographing water. They allow you to get nice, clean shots. They're two really simple tools that help you to manage the environment that you're working in and get the photos that you want. Before we start shooting, there are two more pieces of kit we need to take a look at, remote releases and tripods. Pick the tripod that suits you best. You need to be comfortable carrying it, but equally, the sturdier, the better. Remote releases can be really useful in a number of different situations and could be the key to you getting that great landscape shot. If you set a long exposure on your camera, use a remote release. If you trigger the camera manually, you risk moving it and therefore blurring your image. Remote releases can be wired or wireless, and the one you choose depends on how far you want to be from the camera. But by liberating the need to actually touch the camera, you could achieve some fantastic results. Now that we've got all of our equipment sorted, you're ready to head into the field. Landscape expert David Clapp has been shooting in the Lake District for over seven years. He'll be looking at framing, perspective and depth of field, helping you understand how to master them. The dramatic scenery and constantly changing weather make every day a new experience, so it will give us a great backdrop to run through the basics of capturing that perfect landscape shot. After that, we'll be heading to South Africa with our second expert landscape photographer, Martin Osner. He'll be explaining the principles of light and exposure, making the most of the glorious conditions and varied landscape and showing us how to work with them. Finally, we'll be going to both experts for their advice on how to capture water and the different methods you can use to achieve striking results. We're going to look at all the elements that will help you frame the perfect picture in any location. Consideration and preparation of your shot is where all this begins. We'll look at the best camera positions and vantage points. The next step is the composition, how we place our subjects within the frame. Finally, we'll look at all the foreground and the proportions. There's a lot to take in, but being out on location is the best way to learn. There's something wonderful about getting out into the landscape and shooting amazing natural scenery. Take time to consider where you're going to shoot. Generally, you don't want lots of people in your shots, so stay well away from walking paths and places where lots of people congregate. You'll probably have to hike into the locations to find some quiet views. You should be able to bring everything you need in just one rucksack. The beauty of the landscape is that you can control most things in camera with just the aid of a tripod, so you can avoid carrying lots of bulky kit. If you come fully prepared, then you'll be able to get great shots, whatever the conditions. A set of binoculars can be a handy tool to help you find potential hot shooting spots that you may not spy with the naked eye. It's a good idea to look at pictures from other photographers in the same location. They've already done the hard work for you and found the best photogenic areas. Even if these are just used as a guide, it's sometimes nice to know what you should expect. The secret of finding the perfect location to shoot is patience. Be prepared to spend time moving around the area with your camera and testing the look of different vistas through your lens. Try walking up to higher ground and see how the landscape opens out before you. Or maybe you want the reverse perspective from the bottom of the valley looking up towards the peaks. There's so many ways to approach every location, which is why it's important to look at it from as many different angles as possible. Also, keep an eye out for interesting features like waterfalls or unusual rock formations. The more time you spend preparing and considering your shot, the better the results will be. We're at a high viewpoint on the top of the Lake District, which looks down over the whole of Keswick to Derwent Water and up into the fells and the clouds behind. We've got a, a wide angle view that we can take here with some foreground. We've also got the mid ground being Keswick and Derwent Water, the lake behind, and then finally to the fells and the clouds above. So I've got to think about how I'm going to frame this up what I'm going to do and how I'm going to position the camera accordingly. So I'm going to use a wide angle lens and I'm going to literally just go straight in on this section here and frame up my shot. Now, what's happened when I take my first shot is that everything's a little bit too wide. It's not working as well as I would hope. So I'm going to try and tighten this up and bring the, the framing in better by using the zoom on the camera's lens. 
perhaps drop my camera down just slightly more. And there we have it. The reason why this works so well is we've got nice framing, but also we've got great separation between tonality throughout the frame and also through colour as well. We've got the light greens at the bottom, we've got the darker midder tones in the centre, uh, going up through the frame to the lighter grey sky at the top. One of the great things about landscape photography is changing focal length because you can actually pick out parts of the landscape that although are present within a vista can become just as much of an interesting frame filling shot. So I'm going to change this lens over from a wide angle lens to a telephoto lens in order for me to pick out just parts of the landscape for extra detail. So I'm going to be looking for a flow perhaps a, a contrast line that's going to pull my eye through the frame and take me to another focal point. Looking across to the scene, we can see there that there's parts of the lake, the shoreline takes your eye around the frame and takes you up into the mountains behind. So I'm going to frame the bottom half of the picture with the lake being pulling your eye through up to the fell scene behind. Well, I've tried to get it so that there's a high contrast line between the lake and the hillside itself, weaving its way up through the frame and taking you to the mountain scene behind. So I've just got to make sure I've got my focusing right, tidy up the frame, make sure that I'm 100% happy with the composition before pressing the shutter. I'm very pleased with the composition in the way that the eye is pulled through the frame up to the focal point, up to the subject matter, being the mountains and the fells behind. So I've come down here to get a sense of scale to the landscape by using a bench and the two people overlooking this fantastic vista. I'm using a 24 to 70 lens, and what this will do is allow me to frame them with the bench in the bottom right-hand corner, the fells mounted scene in the back top left. I'm also going to use a fairly large aperture, f11. And what this will do is make sure that everybody is in focus, that they're in focus and also uh, the scene behind. So I'll frame this up and see what we can do. There we go, on to f11, press the shutter. So I need to actually tweak the composition just a fraction more. What I've got to do is not cause the bench to, to get too small, a wider angle shot will reduce this size. So I've got to actually zoom in slightly more to give it a, a greater feeling as though the, the people on the bench are actually within the scene, not just a subsidiary. So I'm going to choose uh, a longer focal length and pull them into the frame a fraction more. Having the human content and having the bench within the scene gives everything a great sense of scale. It's positioning you as though you feel as though you could be there enjoying the vista and the scene yourself. So this is crucial to the success of the picture and uh, can certainly give people a great emotional engagement. Now we're going to move on to perspective, which is a huge part of landscape photography. When I like to frame up a shot, I like to look for converging lines that pull my eye through the frame. Something as simple as this jetty, which is on the banks of Dermot Water in the Lake District, is absolutely perfect and ideal for this exercise. We've got an architectural man-made subject that's pulling our eye through the frame to the focal point of the image. In this case, it's the fell on the opposite side of the water. Well, although this isn't really a true example of a vanishing point, we have converging lines that are literally meeting at the end and touching together. An example of it could perhaps be uh, an agricultural field with rows of potatoes or, or something on those lines. We've nearly got it uh, at a vanishing point at the end of the pier, but we can exaggerate this further by using a wider angle to minimise that area at the very end. Now, camera position is going to be absolutely crucial to the effect of the shot. And in this case, what I've done is I've chosen a lower camera angle for this image. This allows me to maximise... 